Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Please follow along in the bulletin if you'd like, or just listen if you choose. Let us hear the words. They, meaning Jesus, the disciples, and some followers, they came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, that's what Bar means. Bar means son of. So Bar Timaeus, this is the son of Timaeus. A blind beggar was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want? me to do for you. The blind man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. May God add blessing and understanding to the hearing of this word. Have you ever been to restaurants? where the intent of the people in the restaurant is to be rude to you? (laughs) These restaurants actually exist. There's a restaurant in Chicago called Ed DeBevix. And you are to go there, and you're to be rude to your waiter, and your waiter is supposed to be rude to you. I hate that place. (laughs) The last thing I want when I'm sitting down to have a good meal is for someone to be rude to me. And I never feel good about being rude to someone else. But it is... The thing. It's how they market themselves. And it can be kind of funny. I'm, I'm not denying that it can't be kind of funny. I took a youth group there one time because they were dying to go on their Chicago mission trip to Ed DeBevix. And I was like, I've never heard of this place. And they're like, oh, it's really fun. People get up and they sing songs and they dance on the tables. They didn't tell me about the rude part. I'm like, oh, getting up on the table, that sounds like fun. Let's go dance, yay. Uh, In preparation for our little trip to Ed DeBevix, unknown to me, four of my youth had bought water guns. And they put them in their pockets. So we're going through, and our waiter is waiting on us, and then another table right next. And it's another large table with a lot of youth, and we're a large table with a lot of youth. And... It's amazing how people can say things to each other in this place and get away with it because you could never get away with it. And so he was being rude to the table across from us and they were being rude. And he finally just said, I can't believe this. Does anybody have a gun? Four water pistols showed up out of the blue. (laughs) He took one, sprayed everybody at the table, gave it back to them and said, thank you. And then they sprayed him as he went away. Rudeness. It's like they come to the table and they say, what do you want? There's a restaurant like that in Atlanta. It's well known. It's called the Varsity. It is one block away from the stadium where Georgia Tech plays football. Great burgers, amazing onion rings. But as you get to the cash register to make your order, it's like, what do you want? Gates Barbecue in Kansas City, same thing. They don't even wait for you to get close. They're they're taking order six and seven people back, so they have to scream at you. Hey, what do you want? And if you don't know how to order at Gates Barbecue in Kansas City, they don't like it. There's a specific way to order your food. Turkey on bread with fries. They understand that. You were confused right now. People will ask you soon, what do you want? You've already heard the Christmas music. You've already seen the displays. 
you know that pretty soon Santa Claus is going to have a chair somewhere and people are going to bring their children and they're going to be sitting on Santa's lap. And what is Santa going to say? Little girl, little boy, what do you want? Our families will do that for us even as adults because they want to make sure that they get us what we want. They don't want to give a bad gift. What do you want? At a restaurant or around Christmas time, those are pretty good questions. It's, pre it's probably not a bad life question to ask yourself, what do I want? Or to ask your friend, what do you want? To ask your spouse, what do you want? It's a good communication tool. It's all right because we can say, what do we want? And we can set our goals and we can work toward what we want. My thought, though, is that as good a life question that that can be, if it's asked in faith, it may mean something else. It may have different consequences when we ask the question. Today in our, our story, Bartimaeus is sitting on the side of the road. He's blind. He's been blind for a long time. And he's sitting there, and all of a sudden he realizes, who has just come to town? Jesus. Jesus has just come to town. And so he asks to get into Jesus' face, as the kids at my last school would say. He's trying to get an appointment. We might be more comfortable with that language. He wants to be able to see Jesus because he believes. He believes that if he just gets close, he can be healed. He's sure of it. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Shh, be quiet, Bartimaeus. We don't need to disturb the master, the teacher, the Messiah. Quiet. He yells louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus hears. Jesus hears. Now maybe he hears for a different reason. Maybe it's not just that, you know, I'm sure that Jesus walks down the street. He's surrounded by his CIA, the disciples. His secret service, I guess, to use a better term. They're shielding him, protecting him, trying to keep people from just getting up to him. And so he hears his name all the time, I'm sure. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He can't go anywhere without there being crowds. So I'm sure that people were calling for him all the time. But in this gospel, this is the first time that this name is used. For the first time in the Gospel of Mark, we hear the words, Son of David. Son of David, have mercy on me. Now, we may not think too much about that. We may not think anything about that. It's just a title. It's just a name. No, it's very significant in this Gospel. There is no genealogy in the front of this Gospel. In... Um, Mar, uh, I'm sorry, in Matthew and in Luke, in the first or the third chapter, depending on which gospel you're in, you will get a genealogy. And the genealogy will always connect Jesus with David. Has to. Because the Messiah has to be related to David. David was the warrior king. David was the, the one who solidified the promised land for the promised people. Israel became strong under David's mighty acts of valor. He was a military man. He got the job done. The next king, Solomon, he just asked for wisdom. He didn't have to secure the borders anymore. They were secure. David did that. David was the greatest king, the most powerful king. And if the Messiah was going to come along and get Israel restored to its privileged relationship with God, to bring, again, a strong nation. Well, they had to be related. God and David had a covenant with each other. And that covenant said, as long as there's a king in Israel, then that 
king will be from the house of David. Therefore, Jesus has to be related to David to be whom everybody expects him to be. And in the Gospel of Mark, this is the first time we hear that language. Son of David, have mercy on me. Now, the other interesting part about that is that this is exactly the last story before Jesus goes to Jerusalem for the last time. Palm Sunday. We're a long way away from it, right? But this gospel message today is one gospel message just in front of Palm Sunday. When Jesus is ushered into Jerusalem, when Jesus comes forward and says, um, put me on a donkey, not a great white horse, not a stallion, put me on a donkey. People are excited and they tear up the city because the Messiah has come. The warrior king is back. He is come. Son of David is here. And Bartimaeus, the blind one, is the first to know it. Jesus calls him over. What do you want? What do you want? What do you want from me? And we know the story. I want to see. Your faith has made you well. And he sees Now, the last interesting part of this whole thing is Jesus says, go on your way. And what does he do? He remains with Jesus. He stays with Jesus. He doesn't leave. He stays. He becomes a follower. Now, we don't know what that means. We don't know how far it is that that Bartimaeus is willing to go with Jesus down the path. We don't know if he just makes it through the Palm Sunday procession, the parade The excitement when everybody is like, oh, Jesus, son of David, Hosanna, Hosanna. We don't know if he makes it all the way to the cross. But what we know is that receiving his sight and being told to go away, he doesn't. He stays. He's a follower. Not so long ago, as a congregation... We asked ourselves, what do we want? Surely you know the answer. Those of you who have been around here for a year or so, surely you know the answer. We want to take care of this building. We want to grow personally and spiritually. We want to further and deepen our service to this community of Macomb and even beyond. And we want to bring in new people, and especially we want to make this church open and inviting and welcome to young people. Those are our five goals. We've asked ourselves, what do we want? We've set up teams of people to start working towards these goals. We've changed our worship service. We have changed our bulletin look. We have instituted new programs. We've cleaned our nursery. Right now, we're a little internal, but it's okay. We should be. We need to be. Trying to get ourselves ready to meet our goals, there's nothing wrong with that. We're working every day because we believe that God is in this process. And in part... The way we've gotten to our goals is because we've asked this question. What does God want from us? If that's not how we got there, because I wasn't here. If that's not how we got to that, these five goals, that should have been the way we got to our five goals. Reversing the question instead of Jesus or God asking, what do you want from me? We've asked, what do you want from us? To me, that's the right process. To me, if we can change that question around and not expect so much from God and only have set ourselves up to be able to say, God, what do you expect from us? When we become servants like Jesus has become a servant, when we become servants like God has served us so well in the past, today, and in the future, it makes a difference to how we live. Reversing the question that Jesus asked Bartimaeus. I think is important to us. It reminds me of a book. I like to share books with you. 
This is a book to me that I bet many of you have already read, The Shack. Any, anybody read The Shack? Yeah, about half. For those who don't know, there's a guy named Mac. A guy named Mac, and he's not been very close to God for a while. He's had a lot of very bad life experiences early in his life. And I don't want to give away too much of the book because you want to read it after you hear the sermon, I'm sure. But he has a lot of difficulty with his father. He leaves home at a young age. Even with all of those difficulties early in his life, he grows up, he matures, he's a good man. But not too close to the church. Not too close to God. Kind of on the periphery. As a young father, he has this incredible life experience. He talks with his wife, Nan, he says, I'm going to take the kids for a camping trip. And she's like, well, that's fine, because I'm going to go visit. So he takes them for a camping trip. And on the very last day, in those last moments before you'd pack up and leave, his two oldest children say, can we take the canoe out one last time? And he says, yes. Leaving him at the campsite with his youngest daughter, The canoe overturns. There are lots of families in this campsite. They've all been camping there together for a long time. And they're like, hey, Mac, the canoe's overturned. Everybody runs to the side of the lake. He jumps in, saves his children, brings them back to shore. And in the process, he comes back to his campsite and his youngest daughter is gone. 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 Forever. She was abducted never to be found again. Through the process of trying to find his daughter, they track a truck to a shack in the hills and mountains of Oregon, and all they find is a dress with some blood on it. And that's where it ends, that part of the story for Mac. Well, of course, it never ends right there. He goes home and has to try to, to explain this to his wife. He has two children who feel the grief of being the ones who were in the canoe that made him have to leave his daughter. Takes him further away from his faith, takes him further away from God, has nothing really to do with the church. And then one day, he gets a letter in the mail from Papa. Papa. The letter says, come to the shack. Come to the shack? Come to the shack? What can this mean, he thinks to himself. Come to the shack? Who's doing this? Who's doing this? Is it the killer? Is he trying to lure me there? What's going on with this? He doesn't talk to his wife about it. By this time, his kids are old, and he doesn't know what to do. He consults a friend, and he decides he's going to go. The experience that he has at the shack is amazing. He has this encounter with God and with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit that seems unreal. It seems hard to believe. In fact, I'm not sure I do. But in the process of having this experience, he finds out things about the killer. He finds out where his daughter has been placed. He leaves with much less Grief and sorrow and anger. This whole time that he has been at the shack, God and Jesus have basically said, what do you want? Would you like some coffee? Would you like some breakfast? Would you like to try to walk on water? Would you like to know
at the end of the experience where he's been in this shack that had actually been transformed into something other than what it was. It's time to go home. So he gets in a vehicle that he got from a friend because he didn't have the necessary 4 by 4 capabilities to make it to the shack. And he's driving home at peace in his soul. His faith transformed, his life transformed. The light turns green in a small town and he goes through the light and is immediately hit by a drunk driver. He's in the hospital and he becomes aware that there are people that he knows and there are people that he doesn't know and through the course of time he finds out that he's been in and out of consciousness and he's having trouble remembering and then the friend whom he confided in, the friend who gave him the jeep to go to the shack, asks, was it real? Was Papa really there? And it all clicks. And he remembers why he went to the shack in the first place. He remembers every experience so clearly in his mind. He tries to tell his wife all about it, but she is skeptical. He brings his daughter to him and and he says, man, I just need to talk to her. Get our son out of here. And he says words to her that he probably needed to say 30 years ago, but he was going through his own grief and didn't know how to do it. And he takes her and he says, we don't blame you. It's not your fault. Don't live with this guilt anymore. She breaks down immediately. Nan goes, I believe. I believe this experience that you had was real. He helps authorities find his daughter. They track down the killer. What do you want? If anybody had a right to ask, what do you want? Mac had a right to ask. I want my family back. I want my daughter back. I want to have a a stronger relationship with my wife that didn't have to go through this, this horrible circumstance. I want... If the Christ came to you and asked, what do you want? If God came to you and asked, what do you want? Wouldn't you say some of those kinds of things? I mean, surely you wouldn't say, oh, I want riches and fame and wealth. It's not like Aladdin's jumping out of a a lamp. You would say, I want that strong relationship. I want to repair this time of my life. I want to know certain things. You wouldn't ask for those things. I don't even know if Mac would have been able to to know what to ask for. There's a song by Mercy Me, which fits our scripture so well. Son of David, have mercy on me. Mercy Me has this song, and the lyrics go something like this. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? It's talking about coming into a presence with Jesus or with God at the end of time. But I'm telling you right now, God is sitting in your face. God is right with you now, every day, asking, What do you want? What do you want? Don't be shy. Don't be overwhelmed. Simply answer. But here's the thing. When you have that experience, when it's real and genuine, and you have that experience, you're going to be the one asking the question. God will say to you, what do you want? And you're going to be say, you're going to say, God, I want to serve you. What do you want from me? That's what happened to Mac. 
this great experience which brought him closer to God, transformed his life, made him a servant. This is how the book ends. If you ever get a chance to hang out with Mac, you will soon learn that he's hoping for a new revolution, one of love and kindness, a revolution that revolves around Jesus and what he did for us all and what he continues to do in anyone who has a hunger for reconciliation and a place to call home. This is not a revolution that will overthrow anything, or if it does, it will do so in ways we could never contrive in advance. Instead, it will, it will be the quiet daily powers of dying and serving and loving and laughing, of simple tenderness and unseen kindness, because if anything matters, then everything matters. A message from God to Mac. Last week we asked ourselves, are you ready? This week we ask, what do you want? May we be able to move as individuals and a church to that place in our faith where it's less about us and more about God because everything matters. Amen. Amen.